This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Our scriptural lesson today comes from the fourth chapter of the Gospel according to St. Mark, verse 36 through verse 39 from the English Standard Version of Scripture. Notice there these words. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the, the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. I'm speaking today simply from the subject, protect your peace. Protect your peace. You don't really realize how vitally valuable and important peace is until you lose it. Until somebody disturbs your peace. But I want you to notice what it says in verse 36. How when he was just opening up and it says, as soon as they left the crowd, there's a big key to protecting your peace is to get away from people. Get away from the crowd. Just get away from the crowd. See, crowds drive us mob violence. Crowds stimulate us to do things and, and you can end up losing your peace. You have to get into a place of solitude. You cannot live in the limelight. When you do, you wither and die faster. You have to get away from the crowd. Even Jesus, the Son of God, had to get away from the crowd. You know why? Because he was the Son of God. He was a healer. He was a teacher. He was a deliverer. And everybody had needs. And when they've got needs, it reminds you of your needs. And it drains you when you're the life giver helping other people to solve their problems. And so when you give yourself helping people, I mean, I don't care how good a doctor is, how good a counselor is, how good an attorney is, how good an accountant is. When you're dealing with people and problems, people have problems. It's the problems that people have that start draining you and you start feeling the pull on you. So Jesus had to get away from the crowd himself and go apart and rest a while because he felt the drain. And so a large part of protecting your peace is knowing when to leave the party. Because you can drain yourself just by being around a certain kind of, of neediness in the lives of people, meeting their expectations, meeting their demands, hearing their issues that are going on in their life. And then notice the second component in verse 36 as well, is that they took Jesus in the boat with them as he was. Not as they hoped him to be. They received Jesus into their boat as he was. They let Jesus be Jesus. They said, come on, come on and go with us. Come on and go with us. And when you really, really understand the real nature of peace, um, you, you, you'll discover that real nature of peace is not something that you go out outside to get. Peace is an inside job. So whenever there is stress in your life, it is not that you are bringing the peace in, you are causing it to come up. It's emerging within. Peace is an inside job. It's an in, inside job. It's not something you call in. Peace is actually something that you let out. And I want you to think of yourselves as a thermostat, not a thermometer. And so when there's chaos and confusion in the atmosphere, set your thermostat to peace. 
The peace is an inside job. You release peace from the inside and it changes the outside. Listen, you can't get control of a situation until you get control of yourself. So it's, a, it's about being able to protect your peace. It, it, you've already got peace. It's simply that you have to clear the clutter, clear the chatter, because you can make as much noise with your mind as you can with your hands and your feet. So you have to silence the chatter, the clutter that's on the line, and the peace will emerge. The peace is within. You don't discover it until you get alone and get quiet. And find that place of solitude where there is a peace, a contentment on the inside of you. It's not about getting something out there. You can't get peace in a bottle. I'm sorry, you can't get a shot and get peace. It's not in a syringe. Peace is a person. His name is Jesus, the Prince of Peace. He's the Prince of Peace. He's a person. We receive him into our heart, and from that point on, it becomes an inside job. Please understand this. In life, you will have challenges. You will have problems. That's a given. But peace is not the absence of trouble. Peace is the result of the awareness of the presence of God with you. Peace is not the absence of trouble. Peace is the result of the awareness of the presence of God with you. If you know that God is with you, you can handle anything. Jesus said, lo, I am with you now always, even unto the ends of the earth, as long as I'm with you. I'm a provider. I'm a protector. I'm a deliverer. I'm a guider. I'm a counselor. Whatever you need. And he says, just know that I'm with you. It is not that it is the absence of problems. It is the awareness of the presence of God with you. God is with me. You can be going through the worst storm of your life, but when you know God is with you, there's a peace that lets you know that God is with me. And that peace is the greatest indication that you're in the will of God. It is the greatest single indicator that you're in the will of God when you have peace. I went to pray for my aunt some years ago when she was in, in the hospital the night before she was scheduled to have open heart surgery. And I knew that she was not going to rest until I got there. And when I got there, I went into her room and I prayed the presence of the power of God down. And she looked up after, at me afterwards and she said, I'm ready now. I'm ready. She almost overslept. She, you know, you don't normally sleep well in a hospital bed. That's not your bed. And you know what? You're going to be split open the next day. And they opened her chest, but she said, I got that peace now. I got that peace. She knew at that moment that everything was going to be all right. She had the surgery. She recovered just like that. She had no complication. She knew ahead of time. The only thing that she had to give the guarantee of that was the presence of God's peace. Didn't mean that she didn't have a blockage in her heart. But it meant that she was aware of the presence of God that was with her. And that whatever it is that I face is going to be all right. God is with me. It is an awareness. It's not the absence of trouble. You can be dealing with hell and high water at the same time. And sometimes when it rains, it pours. And you'll get challenges over here and challenges over there and challenges. But when God is with you, God is greater. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So God is greater. You have to be aware of the presence of God with you. And it will produce a peace in your heart, in your soul, in your mind that will surpass all understanding. And while other people are stressed out, you will be able to have a rest in your heart and that's why you can have peace amid your storm because peace is about a focus of your heart on God peace is about focus it is about a focus 
on God and not on the circumstances. It is a focus on God and not on the symptom. It is a focus on God and not the chatter. It is a focus on God and not the news. It is a focus on God and not your deficit in your bank account. It is a focus on God and not the medical report. It is a focus on God and not what other people have said. It is a focus on God and not the negative comments that have come on social media. It's a focus on God. I love something that Dr. Tony Evans said that if the devil can't hinder you with difficulties, he'll choke you with distractions. You have to understand how the devil works. If the devil can't destroy you, he'll distract you. He's working to try to distract you. I've told you before, distraction is the destruction of your dreams in slow motion. So whenever the devil is trying to dismantle a vision that God has given to you, whenever he's trying to discourage you from a vision that God placed on the inside of you, distraction is the destruction of your dream in slow motion. And he tries to use the slowness of it to derail you. Because whatever he can't destroy, he'll try to distract with an issue, with a problem, with a challenge, with an offense. He is a major distractor. If you can't stop a locomotive, the next best thing is to derail it, get it off its focus. More dreams go unfulfilled through broken focus than any other thing that I know. And when it breaks your focus, it breaks your peace. And that's why peace is not the absence of problems. Peace is an awareness of the presence of God with you. May you know beyond the shadow of a doubt, no matter what you experience in this life, God is with me. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. God is with you. And if God is with you, everything is all right. Everything is all right. Everything is all right. Keep your focus and be intentional. Notice what Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3 and 4 says. You keep him. This is not particular to men. This is, this is mankind. You keep him. You keep her in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you, not on the news, not on the negative report, not on the deficit. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Why? Because he trusts you. Because she trusts you. You keep them because they trust is tied to trust. The peace is tied to your trust. Trust in the Lord forever for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. The reason that this speaks of a rock is because a rock speaks of stability. If Stone Mountain is out there today, it'll be there tomorrow. Jesus is a rock of ages. The rock that has sustained himself throughout the ages. It, it is to say that I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. He'll be there. He said, I'm a rock. I'm a rock. And so I'll keep you if you put your trust in me. You, you don't have to be able to understand it. Trusting God is deeper than having faith. It is when something goes wrong in your body and something goes wrong in your life and something goes wrong in your marriage and you don't understand it because you would trying to dot all of the I's and cross all of the T's and you can't figure God out and something goes wrong just like my mother when I was born you know I'm son number four out of six and uh, my mother had had a, a child the year before I was born and then a child the year before that and there were people that saw her and every time they saw her they said girl you pregnant again uh, you know, they would ask her, you ain't had that baby yet? And they didn't realize this was three different pregnancies, just one year after another. Bim, bop, bam, you know, and this is her fourth child. And they, every time they saw her, she was pregnant. And she got embarrassed about it. She said, oh, this is nothing but an old tumor. <laughs> and guess what? When I was born, she spoke that. The doctor told her, you got a tumor in your uterus. And they said, Let's, let me operate and take it out. Mama said, no, 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 God will heal me. Well, let me tell you, that tumor grew in mama's body for 25 years. It grew to the size of a grapefruit. And I went over to see her one Friday. And I just, I just ministered to her on faith. She was scheduled to go in the hospital that Monday. 
and have the tumor removed that had been growing in her body for 25 years that caused an extremely heavy menstrual flow every single month as a result of that. And uh, so they, she went in on Monday for them to get the screening so that they could get the exact dimensions of the locations and the size of the tumor that was the size of a grapefruit and they couldn't find it. Mama is 88 years old today and she still has not had the surgery and they still can't find the tumor. And she was just as resolute in her spirit when the doctor said, let me do the surgery. She says, no, 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 God will heal me. That was a peace. She knew God was with her and my mother wasn't worried about it. I never saw her stay up. I never saw her speak anything concerning it that she was worried about that. She said, God will do it. And God did it. I'm just telling you, she had a peace. And when you live by peace, God will somehow move in an incredible way in your life. It, it reminds me, uh, Rudyard Kipling is, is one of my favorite poets. Who, and I, I love his poem, If, If, If You Can Keep Your Head. Uh, when uh, all about you, when others are losing theirs and blaming it on you, and if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, it's a delicate balance. If you can think and not make thoughts your aim. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. That's a beautiful poem. I don't have time to go through it. But read it on your own. You can look it up online. If by Rudyard Kipling. But let me just remind you of this. Look to the Lord for your protection. No matter how bleak things look. Look to the Lord. Look to the Lord. Look to the Lord. Second Samuel chapter 22 verse 31. Notice this. God's way is perfect. All the Lord's promises prove true. Prove true. All God's promises prove true. It's impossible for God to lie. He is a shield for all who look to him for protection. If there's something that's chasing you and scaring you in this world. God is our protection. He's our protection. How does that relate to peace? Well, I can't have peace if I feel vulnerable. I cannot have peace if I feel unprotected. It is God's peace that actually, it's his protection that produces his peace. It is the presence of God that brings the protection of God that produces the peace of God. God's presence bring produces his protection his protection produces his peace because God protects those who trust in him God protects those little David as a teenage boy said who is this uncircumcised Philistine that is defying our God he trusted in God he says bring the Goliath to me let me let me meet him he says listen he says my God will deliver you into my hands he's a young boy he doesn't have any armor. He doesn't have a sword, a shield. But he says, God will deliver you into my hand. And God did. Because he trusted in God and God was his protector. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, those Hebrew boys. One was thrown, Daniel thrown in the lion's den. God became his protector and sealed the mouths of the lion. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into a fiery furnace. God became their protector. When they came out of the fire, they didn't smell like smoke and not even a hair on their head was singed because God protected his people. May I remind you that when the children of Israel did their journey out of Egypt into the promised land, that 40-year journey, and the Bible says there was not one sick person, not one feeble person among them, and their clothes and their shoes didn't wear out in 40 years. I don't have any 40-year-old clothes, do you? 
Good luck on your shoes not wearing out for 40 years. God is your protector. I'm telling you, when you trust him, if you don't have much money, God can keep those bald tires on your car still rolling. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Well, you couldn't afford to do what you needed to do and you had to just trust him to be your protector. You knew it wasn't safe, but I don't have a choice. I still have to get to work, Jesus. With Jesus... Not only take the wheel, but be a wheel, God. Be a fence all about me, Jesus, because this is dangerous. I know I'm in trouble. I need help. I'm a, I'm, I don't have but a quart of oil in my car, Jesus. Please, Lord, don't let this thing stop on me. Have you ever been at the stop sign and you got one foot on the gas and one on the pedal because you're scared the car is going to cut off? He is our protection. He's our protection. He's our protection. And Jesus, Jesus is on the boat with his disciples. And the Bible says the disciples were scared to death because they were listening to the news. They were looking around and the wind and the water scared them to death. The wind, the air. And see, the news is airways. And it's flooding us with negative information because the negative information sells. It's clickbait. We want to hear about who died and who got stabbed and who got robbed last time at Lenox Mall. And, you know, we, we, it's just, we're just interested in the negative news. They will not tell anybody about the power of God that heals somebody in a church. They will not talk about somebody that received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and began to speak in another language, how God delivered somebody from an addiction, how somebody who was struggling here and God somehow transformed their life, how God promoted someone on their job when they were not even fully qualified for it, how you were approved for a car or a house. And th th that's not going to make the six o'clock news, I'm sorry. But they were listening to all of that stuff and they were afraid and they went to Jesus who's in the same boat on the same waters in the same storm but Jesus is on the boat sleep and they're on the boat worried. What's the difference? Jesus wasn't looking at the circumstances. Jesus was trusting in his father. He knew his father was with him. They were all in a storm but Jesus was the only one on the boat who had no storm in him. They were in the storm, but there was no storm in Jesus. The others brought the storm in it because they started talking about the storm, about how bad it was, about how hard times are. And whenever you get with your friends, your so-called friends, and you start talking about the storm, those are people that are robbing your peace. You have to guard your peace. Guard your peace. It's like, uh, 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 don't bring that in here. I'm walking in victory. God is my provider. I know gas prices are up, but you know, I thank God that he's able to still get me from point A to point B. I still have to go in some things that I'm going to do, and I'm not going to shrink down and back away. I have faith in God. Thank God for his provisions. Stop cursing the darkness and light a candle. Light a candle, light a candle and celebrate the goodness of Jesus and see they're all in the same storm. You can get in the water without the water getting in you if you keep your mouth closed. The only reason that people get in the water and start drowning is because they, they've got the, the orifices open. If you get in the water without opening your mouth and the way to keep your peace is to hold your peace. Stop giving everybody a piece of your mind. You your mind is not that big. Trust me, you need all the mind you have. Trust me. Particularly, you will realize that as you begin to age and you walk out of one room into another room and can't figure out why you came into this room. And if you ever stop while you're ascending steps or descending the steps, and you get confused and turn around because you forgot something upstairs and now you can't remember whether I was going upstairs or downstairs. <laughs> this, is, this is why you should never give anybody a piece of your mind because you need all of your mind that you can possibly get. You need all of your cognitive mental faculties. You need it all. You need all of it. And here's the thing. Most people 
they start becoming upset and dwindling their peace away instead of protecting their peace by allowing their feelings to dominate them. Feelings follow thoughts. I can think sad thoughts and all of a sudden the next thing I know I'm feeling sad. I can think about somebody who owes me money and see them out eating an expensive dinner and they have not paid my money back yet. And they're eating dinner and the thought of that, you follow what I'm saying? The thought of that actually begins to cause me to get into my feelings. Is that not crazy? Because feelings follow thoughts. Feelings also follow words. You could be feeling wonderful and somebody says something to you that is curt, nasty. It's not just what they say, it's how they say it. And what they say and how they say it, just their words. Nothing changed, just their words, but it shifted your feelings. I was feeling good before this happened, before that happened. I was feeling absolutely wonderful. And then somebody's words, because feelings follow thoughts, feelings follow words. Feelings follow thoughts, feelings follow words, and then feelings follow actions. You know, if somebody slaps you, you, you your feeling will follow. <laughs> because feelings follow actions. Feelings follow actions. Actions, feelings follow actions. And that's the way that feelings are. Feelings follow actions. But not only do feelings follow thoughts and feelings follow words and feelings follow actions, feelings also follow atmospheres. And that's why when you get into the atmosphere of other people praising God, other people praying, when you get into an atmosphere Atmosphere where a faith-filled word is being spoken and taught among God's people. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You get in an atmosphere of faith and your faith arises. Peace then fills your heart because atmospheres uh, influence feelings. Just the atmosphere when a man really wants to woo a woman. He takes her into an elegant restaurant. Where there's dim lighting, candle lit dinners. There may even be symphonic music that might be being played loud, you know, live in the place. And the menu is exquisite. And the settings are just right. You're paying for atmosphere. That steak or that chicken didn't cost that much money. <laughs> you are paying for atmosphere because atmosphere shifts your feeling and when they really want to make an impression they take you to a nice atmosphere because it shifts and changes the way that you feel atmosphere sometimes one person can come into your atmosphere and ruin your day and sometimes the wrong person who's already in your presence can leave and shift your whole atmosphere is that not amazing? Because atmospheres, everything happens in an atmosphere. But feelings follow thoughts, feelings follow words, feelings follow actions, and feelings follow atmosphere. Now here's the deal. If you don't like your thoughts, change them. If you don't like your words, change them. If you don't like your actions, change them. And if you don't like your atmosphere, you're not a tree, move. Change. Rent a place and go and look out at the water. Go and look by the water. I, I, I'm, I'm a lover of water. I'm a Brauner. The name Brauner means dweller by the water. I love water. It, it calls me. I draw strength from going places and looking at the mountains. Get into atmosphere. Certain atmospheres, the Spirit of God speaks to me in certain atmospheres. Everything happens in an atmosphere. Get in the right atmosphere. If you need to shift your feelings, shift the atmosphere of where you are. It might be water. It might be in a beautiful garden. It, it, you know, whatever it, it does, it may be a beach for you. Whatever, wherever it is, get into that atmosphere. It'll shift your feelings. Change your actions. You're depressed? Go for a jog. 
It'll stimulate some positive hormones to be released in your body. It's a natural antidepressant. Change your actions. Change your actions, you'll change your feelings. Change your words. Start speaking life. You'll shift how you feel. It'll protect your peace. It will protect your peace. It'll protect your peace. And so, before you throw your peace away over a situation, ask yourself, will this even matter five years from now? Ask yourself, is this worth my losing sleep over? Just certain things are not worth the destruction that it does to your peace. Is this worth my losing my job? Is this worth my losing my integrity? Is this worth my losing my family over? Start asking the right questions. Just ask the right questions. Ask the right question. Will this matter? Will this really matter? Down the road. And you'll discover that God is saying something to us that will awaken us and protect us. And we're talking about protecting your peace, but I want you to realize there's a Hebrew word for peace, which is the word shalom. And shalom is much more than peace as we understand peace to be. Shalom is, is a complete peace. Here's what shalom is. Shalom is a feeling of contentment. It's a feeling of contentment. Shalom is a, is a, is a feeling of completeness, of wholeness of harmony, of prosperity, of safety, and of rest. Uh, when you talk about shalom, it's all of these things, wholeness and completeness and harmony. And so when you're talking about this, it's prosperity. You, it's hard to be at peace when you don't have money to pay your bills. See, there's a shalom, there's a shalom that brings that. So when a person speaks shalom, not only in the Hebrew culture, it was both a greeting to say hello and goodbye. It was their way of saying, go in God's peace, or I come in peace. If they see you coming in shalom, it's like, I welcome you in peace. And when they're leaving goodbye, may you go with God's peace. So when you talk about the shalom of God, it is not just peace as we know it. It is health, it is healing, it is harmony, it is wholeness, it is being able to rest when you get in the bed at night so that your mind is not going in a thousand different directions thinking about this, that, and the worst case scenario. It's a shalom. That's something that comes from the Prince of Peace who lives on the inside of us. And the more that we are aware of this great God who is the God of peace, Wholeness and health flows out of peaceful uh, existence on the inside. That's why you guard, you guard that peace. You guard that peace. The Apostle Paul would often write to the churches. And whenever he, uh, in, in, as, as many times as I have read through the Bible and read the prayers that Paul prayed for his friends, not one prayer is it where, recorded where Paul prayed for God to change the circumstances of his friends but that God would be with them. And Paul would write to the different churches, whether it was the church at Galatia or the, ch the church at Thessalonica. Uh, the, he, he would go to these various churches, the, the, the church at, at, at Ephesus, and, and he would open his words to them saying grace and peace. And it's, it's important as to why he gave it in that order, grace and peace. Because you see, if a wife does not give grace to the husband, there will be no peace in the house. There must be grace first and then peace. Because we are flawed human beings. And if we don't get God's grace, we can have no peace. We are saved by grace through faith. Grace and peace. Shalom. Shalom. Wholeness. Completeness. Wellness. Health. Safety. It, it is this rest that comes. It's shalom. It's a real peace that comes from God that actually passes all understanding. And it blesses our life in a, in a tremendous way. But it's a, it's a blessing. Peace is a perspective based on a promise. It's a perspective based on a promise. I love something how the incredible perspective of the Apostle Paul. We don't realize this. But I want you to just see this. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6 and 7. Notice this. 
don't worry about anything. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Philippi saying, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for what, thank him for all he has done. And then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything that we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. I want you to notice this again. He's given us a formula for peace. He says, don't worry about anything. You can't tell people not to do something unless you give them something to do. He said, instead, pray about everything. Pray about everything. He's given us a formula for getting the peace of God to rise up in you. He says, tell God what you need and thank him for what he has already done. He says, and then you will experience God's peace. Notice this. I want you to understand this is the Apostle Paul writing this not from the comfort of the Ritz Carlton. He's writing this in a dungeon in prison. He's in jail. The Apostle Paul is in jail, but jail is not in him. He's at peace and he's writing to comfort other hurting people and he's in jail. And he's writing and says, don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. And, and God, the God of, of all peace will give you a peace that passes all understanding and it exceeds anything that you'll ever be able to understand. You won't even understand. People will say, you must not understand the gravity of your situation. Because you wouldn't be this cheerful and this happy and this content in this condition if you really understood how serious your situation is. Paul said, I know. I'm locked up. I understand all of that, but my spirit is not in chains. My dream is not in chains. He said, I'm called to preach the gospel. And even though he was locked up, he took his pen out. And preached on paper that we still read today and he's still ministering to saints today that while he was on lockdown and instead of having his attitude poisoned with a bunch of negativity, uh, how people can become so in, you know, encumbered by their own attitudes and issues of their own life that they can become so negative, so pessimistic. So contumacious and iconoclastic because of their having a bad day. Paul didn't have time for that. He was on a mission and he's like, I'm called to preach the gospel. I've got to get this gospel out. No matter what, I've got to get the gospel out. I want you to understand how Jesus works. Because in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God and the Word became flesh. And then that flesh, Jesus, became the incarnate Word of God. Now Jesus is gone and his Word is in us and we now become the incarnate Word of God. Now Paul has this incarnate Word on the inside of him burning like a fire. And he's like, I've got to get it out. They've locked me up, but my pen is free. I will jot my message down and send a letter to Philippi. I'll send a letter to Ephesus. I will send a letter to Galatia. Don't ever let somebody lock you down and think that there is no other way. Because whatever is in you has got to come out. It's not only looking at what's going on on the outside, but it's about who is present on the inside, Christ in you, the hope of glory. The beautiful thing that I love about peace is that peace oftentimes is based on a higher understanding of something. Stephen Covey, a wonderful man, he's in, he's in heaven now, I presume. But he was on the train one day coming home. And he's sitting in the subway car with a gentleman and three children that's just bouncing all over the place. They're swinging from the poles there. They're standing up in their chair. They're just running back and forth and screaming. And it really bothered Stephen Covey. He, he observed it for a while and he just couldn't take it after a while. He slid down and he said, sir, sir, your children. That's all he said, sir, your children. And, and the guy was, he was like in a stupor. He, he said, oh, 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 I'm, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. 
He said, you see, we just left the hospital. Their mother just died. And now his having that understanding changed his disposition from one being judgmental of the man's parenting skills to one of empathy and compassion. Sometimes there's a higher revelation that will give you a tolerance of a situation because everybody is fighting a battle and you don't know what they're dealing with. And you might just be catching a glimpse of something that is beyond their control and they may be doing the best that they can under the situation. Nothing changed about the situation, but his understanding of the background now brought a tolerance. It stripped the frustration out of him because he's like, doesn't this man see that his children are like monkeys running around on this train and he won't even restrain him? What kind of father is this? But when he understood the shock, trying to wrap his mind around the reality of losing his wife, the mother of his children, and yet seeing their spirits free, he's just, it's all so surreal when it happens. And he's trying to wrap his mind around it. He's disconnected from that moment and still in the trauma of the loss. And that's why peace is a higher understanding. And God will give you an understanding about things sometimes that you, you cannot know in your own strength. And that's why we trust him. Notice what Jesus said. He said in John 16, These things I've spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you'll have tribulations, tests, trials. He says, but be of good cheer. He didn't say be depressed. He said, be of good cheer. Because I've overcome the world. I've overcome the world. And that's why when you stay connected to Jesus, he's already been through trials and tribulation. And he's overcome the world. And if he overcame, he says, as long as I'm with you, you're an overcomer as well. God will put you in some situations on this earth where no two-legged human being can help you out of it. Where only God is the one who can get you out of this. Only God. And there are some difficult, steep places, deep, steep places that you really have to cross on your knees. Take a look at this little video clip. It shows how camels traverse tall sand dunes. They do it on their knees. And there are certain places that you can only climb out of on your knees. You take your time. It takes, it takes longer on your knees. But Jesus told us in, in Luke chapter 21 and verse 19, he says, by patience, possess your souls. By your patience, possess your souls. Patience. Patience and peace are connected because patience is not just waiting. Patience is about how you wait. I've seen men at the mall waiting on their wives. They're waiting, but they're not patient. They are irritated. And sometimes, you know, when they've had an understanding, they give them a time limit. And when that time limit is up, they know I better be, I better be, I better be checking out or there's going to be hell to pay because they're waiting, but they're not patient. Love is patient and kind. If I've got a peace while I'm waiting, I can be kind in the waiting process. And that's why they are connected because here's what stress does. Stress makes you believe that everything needs to happen right now, but faith assures you, assures you that everything you need will happen at the right time. Faith assures you that everything that you need will happen at the right time. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 3 reminds us of that. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not 
tarry. Everything. Please understand this. Everything has a timing. Rest in that. Everything has a timing. To everything, there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. There are some folks that because they haven't gotten married by a certain age, they're messed up and they're comparing themselves with people who are their classmates. People who finish this program with them and that program and they, they're looking at somebody else who's farther along than what they are. And they're wondering, what's wrong with me? You say, Stop the comparison game. It reminded me of the simple things. You know, sometimes my wife will just pop popcorn the old-fashioned way in a pot on the stove. Not, a, not putting it in the microwave and pressing the button and walking off. It's, it's fine if you do that. It's, it's personal preference, I guess. But when you make popcorn the way grandmamas had to make it before we had microwaves, they take a big old pot and put popping oil in that pot, sit it on the fire. And then they put the kernels of corn in there. That was the top on it. And it's interesting what would happen. The kernels don't all pop at the same time. They just pop, 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 pop. I wonder why the popcorn doesn't all pop at the same time. When your time comes, your kernel will explode. And now you will be pow. You'll be a seed, a kernel one moment and pow. You'll be white and fluffy and soft and supple and succulent just in popping oil and leaking in butter. Hang in there. Stay with the heat. God will pop you when it's time concern about other kernels that popped at another time. You'll pop when it's your time. No matter what's popping around you and who's popping and, and they're blowing up, once they, if they stay under that, they will frazzle under that heat while that heat is still getting you ready. There are late bloomers. May I remind you of this? That my own daddy was 40 years old when he started his family. I'm son number four out of six. He was nearly 50 years old when I was born. Had my younger brother at 55. Had my baby brother at 60. Some would have thought that he was popping a little late. But he popped. I'm here because he popped. And I declare to you, if you wait on him, don't set your watch as to what God ought to do in your life based on somebody else popping into their destiny. You'll pop when it's your time to pop. Pop, pop. Here's the admonition of scripture, Hebrews chapter 6, 11, and 12. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. That you do not become sluggish. Do not become sluggish. But imitate those who through faith and patience, faith and patience, faith and patience inherit what has been promised. You inherit the promises of God through faith and patience. And when you realize that, you'll discover that patience will strengthen the spirit. Patience will calm your temper. It'll overpower anger. It'll defeat pride. It will bridle your tongue. It'll restrain your hand. And it'll crush temptation. Remember, temptation, every temptation is temporary. If I can survive this moment... I can live and I can make it. Temptation is temporary. Just make it through the moment. Make it through the moment. Make it through the moment. And you'll discover that it is patience that keeps us from sin. Whenever you hold your peace, you keep it. Whenever you speak your peace, you lose it. And wisdom is simply knowing what to ignore. You don't have to answer everything. Don't respond to everything. Wisdom is knowing what to ignore. Just hold your peace. Protect your peace. Protect your peace. There's certain things that you can't accomplish because if you get it, you may get the thing, but you may lose your peace in the process. 
And if you lose your peace and if you get the thing and lose your peace, you'll discover it wasn't worth it. If something, whatever, listen, whatever costs you your peace is too expensive for you. Whatever costs you your peace. Jesus said this as he was nearing the crucifixion. He said this to his disciples in John chapter 14 and verse 27. Jesus said, peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. I want you to see this. This is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He didn't leave houses. He didn't leave land. He didn't leave stocks and options, bonds. He didn't leave clothes. He didn't leave estate jewelry. He left peace. He says, my peace, my shalom, I leave with you. My wholeness, my prosperity, my rest, my completeness. This thing that will give you a contentment in your heart. Because when you're possessed by greed, you never get enough. But Jesus said, my peace I leave with you. He bequeathed to them the most valuable thing that you could ever have. Shakespeare said, happiness is not having what you want, it's wanting what you have. And when you have peace, godliness with contentment is great gain. When you have the contentment of peace, it is God's way of saying, you got it. And I realize this, the very things that come to try to steal your peace, to rob you of your peace, bad news, negative reports, difficult situations, waiting for an extended periods of time, they sometimes put us in derision and produce an incredible conundrum for our lives and we don't know what to do. May I tell you that I have been at junctures in my life where I didn't know what to do and you'll come to junctures in yours that you don't know what to do and you won't have any guarantees as of the outcome. That's fine as long as I have his peace. As long as I have the shalom of God operating in me, I am always reminded of 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 12. That our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. But we do know what to do. He says, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Nothing blesses me more than vulnerable moments of admitting as frail human beings and limited, finite human beings to say, God, when we don't know what to do, our eyes are on you. We're looking under you, the author and the finisher of our faith. I don't exactly know what to do, God, but my eyes are on you. You've got first move, Lord, and I'll follow you. Where you lead me, I'll follow. I'm trusting you, Lord. There are uncertain days in your life and there are uncertain seasons. And whenever God is shifting you, calling you from and bringing you to, you're in a terrible hallway of discomfort, of being pulled away from the familiar and going into another unfamiliar. But when I don't know what to do, Lord, I look to you. I look to you. And if you have not lived long enough yet to be at this level of befuddled clarity, you will come to places where you won't have all of the answers. Regardless as to how smart you are, how many books you've read and where you have matriculated in schools of higher learning. No matter how many doctors you've talked to, there are some things that only Dr. Jesus can do when I don't know what else to do. But I've made all of the calls that I could make. When I've done everything that I know to do, when I'm eating right and when I'm exercising, when I'm giving faith declarations 
and I've done everything that I know to do in fighting with everything that I have. Lord, I look to you. My eyes are on you, Jesus. You are the finisher of my faith. You're the one that calls us and you're the one who's able to make me to stand. God, may you now fill us with your shalom, your wholeness. Stand to your feet. May the Lord bring into your mind, into your household, wholeness, completeness, safety, safety. May he quell every anxious thought. Some of you have been dealing with panic attacks, anxiety attacks, your mind racing and you can't even control it. Shalom. 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 This is not a word. This is a whole statement of the essence of God's all-encompassing complete peace that transcends your capacity to understand it. Shalom to the confusion in your family. Shalom to your identity. Shalom. Harmony, harmony, harmony. Come to the systems of your body. Shalom. You're in an atmosphere right now. Expectation is the atmosphere for miracles. As you expect for God to calm the storms, all that Jesus did was release the word when they woke him up. And if your life is in the worst storm of your life, you leave the crowd, popular opinion, and the consensus of how the world thinks, and you stand with Jesus who's asleep, I cannot tell you in this dispensation of time more than anything else I've seen an image of a sleeping church. But there is a horn in the heavens that is sounding and saying, stand at attention Zion. I've heard the horn blowing saying, awake, awake church, body of Christ, wake up. And the storm that is raging, the wind that's blowing, the water that is filling the ship, like I'm going down further and further every day. In one word, Jesus can say, rebuke the wind. To say, peace, settle down, be still. Peace, he called it in. And said, be still. It was already in him. He just let it out. He let it out into the atmosphere. He let the tranquil atmosphere that was in here affect the atmosphere that was raging out there. That's the power of shalom. When I declare to you in the name of Jesus today that you protect your peace. This is over every fiery dart of the enemy that is saying that what vision that God gave you, the dreams, the plans that are already laid out and because they've been delayed he makes you feel as though they've been denied. But the devil is a liar. I speak shalom to every anxious thought, every fear, every trepidation, every worry that is filling your life over your life, over a family member's life, over your finances, over a tax situation, over property that you need to sell, over the condition of your automobile, over the, the breakdown of things in your home. The same way that the Lord said to Martha, Martha, you're concerned about too many things. Mary had the same kind of stuff going on, but she was sitting at the feet of Jesus. I told you, peace is based on a revelation that Jesus is with you. He's with you. He's in the storm with you. And just one word from him shifts and calls what is raging to immediately be still in the name of Jesus. Every thought that has been blowing against your house 
It's like the big bad wolf that's been huffing and puffing and trying to blow your house down, trying to cause you to implode, trying to collapse. I speak strength. Let the weak say I am strong. I am strong. I am strong. May strength come to you in the name of Jesus. May strength come to you. May clarity come to your mind. May there come a pertinacity that I'm going to stand and I'm going to believe God no matter what I hear, no matter what I see, no matter how I feel. I believe the Bible. I believe the word of Jesus. I believe you, Lord. May your power fill me now. May shalom come into this atmosphere and fill hearts and minds in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Shalom. 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 Speak that word to somebody near you. Shalom. Whatever you need, send it out. It'll come back. Send it out. It'll come back. Shalom. 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 The shalom of God is in the house. And one word from God will change your situation. Peace, shalom, be still. He'll only let it rage for so long. And then God says, settle down. You've gone long enough, devil. You've caused enough trouble in the family, devil. That's enough. Satan, the Lord rebukes you. <laughs> Woo! My, woo! My God. Satan, the Lord rebuke you. <laughs> my God, my God. I feel victory in this atmosphere. God is our protector. He's our healer. He's our deliverer. He's our savior. He's the lifter of our head. He's the giver of every good and perfect gift that comes from above, from the Father of lights. He's the one that's able to make you to stand even after you've fallen many, 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 many times. He is able to make you to stand in the name of Jesus. It's your time to pop. <laughs> Glory to God. You will not be the same man, same woman coming out of the storm as the one that went in. There will be such a deeper, more mature, rooted faith on the inside of you. A greater love and a compassion for life and zest for life. You're coming out. You are coming out. You're coming out. Whenever you go through something, it means that you're coming out on the other side. You don't get stuck in, I'm just going through it. I'm going through it. The way out is through. The way out is through. I'm going through it. I'm going through it. I'm coming out on the other side. Jesus is going to be exalted. And I just want you to know today that the King of glory, the Prince of peace, releases his shalom over you, his harmony over your life, over your business, over your deals that's on the table. Shalom, peace. Over every cell in your body, shalom, shalom. May it come into order in Jesus' name, shalom, shalom. To every contentious relationship, shalom, shalom. The shalom of God can do what counselors and attorneys would take decades to do. Shalom, shalom, shalom. May the peace of God, the wholeness, the wholeness, the completeness, the harmony, the safety, the prosperity that just comes from shalom, shalom. May shalom come to you. May there be a, a rest in your soul. Sin can wear you out. People's problems can wear you out. Stress and worry can wear you out. Shalom. Shalom, cast your cares upon him for he cares for you. Let it go, let it go. Just let it go, let it go. God sees you. God sees you and he says, I got you. I got you. I got you. I've got you. I got you. I got you. I got you. 
We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.